Welcome to this week's episode of Safety Culture Solutions, brought to you by Safety Culture Strategies. I'm Mike Kinney, your host. Each week we talk about the different facets of a positive safety culture, leadership, employee involvement, communications, continuous improvement, how you get a feel of where your culture is versus where you want it to be. And we have had some great guests, believe it or not, we've been at this for quite a while. We're getting towards the end of season one, depending on how you measure it. And we said, you know, maybe this is a good time to do some reflection on some of the great guests we've heard from throughout this process. So Rick, if you can help us up here in the studio, let's pull up some slides and we're going to talk about reflections on season one of Safety Culture Solutions. We actually started in December of last year, which wasn't that long ago, it seems like. Had a series of premises, if you will, that I wanted to make sure we could capture. We wanted to be forward-looking. What that means, we want to say not only fix it now, but here's some ideas and strategies to help you in the future. We want to be solution-centric. What I'm talking about, I've been some presentations or listened to some other podcasts, and they seem to talk around stuff a lot versus here's some actionable intel, right? Some things can help you get traction as you move forward through your safety culture journey. I want to be able to entertain as, as well as inform. Had some guests and we've had a little bit of fun on the show, which I figure that doesn't hurt anybody's feeling and usually makes for a little better viewing. And definitely we want to provide value to everybody involved, especially our viewers. You're, you're all very busy and be able to carve out time to view what we have to say is greatly appreciated and we want to honor that commitment. And part of how I looked at all this is I, I years ago, I loved to learn how to snow ski up in Washington State. First couple of times I did horrible. Every time I went to the slope, I, I had a lesson with a professional instructor. Usually I had a different instructor each time. And they all had a little slightly different way to work with me so I could get down the hill without falling down all the time. So it's another thing I really like about our guests is you're going to see some different perspective, different thoughts on some of these strategies. So how's it been going to date? Well, we've had some amazing guests. You're going to hear about a few of them today. And again, they're sharing some of these innovative thoughts, things I candidly had not thought of before. But with some of these guests, they have so many years in this estab as established SMEs, PhDs, that yeah, they truly understand it and they give you another look at it. And we've had thousands of views and shares across numerous social media platforms. And I want to thank everybody with help on that as well. Without any further ado, we had Sean Galloway on here, and Sean's the guy. He's president and CEO of ProAct Safety. He's helped hundreds of organizations, including Boeing, NIA, and the U.S. Air Force. He's co-authored five books, including Steps to Safety Culture Excellence. He's had over 600 podcasts, 200 articles, and 100 videos. Yeah, you, you could say it definitely is not his first rodeo. So listening with Sean, and he and I chatted a lot before the show, then obviously afterwards, and we stay a lot in communication. So I want some takeaways for, for Sean, or from Sean. Leaders really need to have a comprehensive strategy. I want to underline that, probably put that in capital letters. You want to have a comprehensive strategy. Get your senior team involved as you're developing a strategy. Then you can accommodate change as you go forward and yet still hit the right trajectory. What is your leadership and coaching style? There's numerous styles and techniques out there for management, which kind of morphs a little bit into coaching. On the management side, you've heard there's everything from authoritarian, or authoritative to dictative. You tell people how you're gonna do it versus, hey, how do you think we should approach it? How do you engage them? What is your current level of maturity? Now that one, that one gave me pause. I said, Sean, what's that mean? He goes, where are you at on this journey? Has your organization, especially your senior team, matured enough that they understand the need to accept candid feedback? That they, when they realize there's change coming, they understand why it's important to the company and in turn why it's important to them. And you gotta understand the why from perception surveys. This has come up a lot with some of my guests 
And some organizations with the best intentions, you'll hear about again later when we we'll talk about Dr. Chuck Pettinger, they get those perceptions and results and they immediately want to respond to them. So make sure you understand the why that's feeding whatever those results are, especially the ones that aren't meeting the goal that you were envisioning. It's a, you, and in the world of safety, it's a constant search to provide value. I've been at this quite a few years. You can tell from my hair color. I'm a certified safety professional, CSP, ISO. We've got lots of different moving parts. One thing that gives me pause when I talk to an organization and they're doing some type of health and safety inspection, but nothing ever really happens with it. They complete the form and they turn it in. Maybe they submit an email. There's no further discussion. Or they say, okay, here's this brand new rule. We have to do it. Oh, there's only one way we can do it. It's going to take 30 hours to train everybody or 100 hours to train everybody. Versus what approaches do we have that provide value to the organization that make a difference? Because candidly, this is Mikey speaking. To do safety for safety's sake, I'm not sure if we're helping anybody. I don't think we're helping professional. I don't know if we're helping your career, maybe not. I'm not sure you're probably helping your organization as much as you could otherwise. Manage what creates your culture or be managed by it. Big picture thoughts from Sean Galway, and he's right on target with that last one. You are responsible for what your culture looks like. You've heard the tagline for safety culture strategies. Every company has a culture, but is it the one you want? Here is a fun guy, Jeff Odiatmanship. He, he was in the Air Force, flew the Warthog, you saw him holding up one of the big rounds they would fire off. And everybody, when you go in the Air Force and you start flying, you get in, you get that call sign. Right? And so you heard like, you know, Bandit or Top Gun or some of those really cool ones. Well, Odie's such a great, Jeff's such a great guy and outgoing and very friendly. His nickname became Odie. <laughs> He's just a phenomenal talent. He, he's authored his own book. He, he's a commercial airline pilot. He flies commercial, not passenger. I check. And he goes, Mike, I'd be glad to take you to Paris, me, but you'd be flying this little tiny seat in the back of the aircraft around big boxes of cargo. So I marked that one off my list. And he's a highly sought after keynote speaker. He and his brother had about a 1943, I believe if I remember correctly, like T6, T9 Texan aircraft they did for all kinds of air shows. And the old ones, you had to spin the prop and make sure you clear the cylinders of any residual fuel before you start. So they'd always do that. Well, Odie was out doing some commercial work. He, his brother, and a pilot were flying the aircraft. It crashed. Neither survived. And all indications are they did not clear the cylinders the way they should have. And Odie, God bless you, he chose that, embraced that emotional challenge, and he started wanting to get the word out to how uh, avoid others in that situation. So we all hear him talk. Everybody has that propeller prop. You have to pull through every time. You do it every time. It has to become automatic for you. Heard him talk about you're pretty much juggling three balls any given time between safety, quality, and production, and it really takes – a pretty much a grand master to keep all those balanced with the same level of importance because it's not uncommon for production to start to go ahead and then quality and safety can be affected. Your thin has, skin has to be, or, I mean, skin has to be as thick as your skull. In other words, you got to have a thick skin when you ask for feedback from the people doing the work. Be prepared, maybe, just maybe, you're not going to hear what you thought you should have because you thought the ring was pretty cool. This is one of my favorites ones from, from Odie. Listen to learn versus listen to argue. I've been in so many sessions with the clients. A lot of times I'm an observer just taking notes. And that senior team member, someone's discussing, and you can just see their body language, and they are poised to jump on what was told to them. They didn't really listen very far into it because they knew they had to be right because they're the, the president, the vice president, wherever they fit. So listen to learn what truly is that me message versus getting ready to argue. Be a leader of inspiration. When people, when people see you walking through that shop floor and says, you know, I like that guy or gal. I really like him as a boss. They're inspiring me to do better. Also, I had Roy Bridges, a retired U.S. Air Force Major General. 
when you look up a big time dude in Wikipedia, I think you're going to see Roy's picture. He'll probably shoot me for saying that. He was center director for Langley Research Center and the Kennedy Space Center. And he was a NASA astronaut on the Space Shuttle Challenger. I've known Roy for many years, and I said, would you do me the honor of coming on the show? And he goes, well, he doesn't do it too often. He says, let's give it a shot. Very well received. Again, just what he's done for this country is, is amazing. And he shared with me that he and his f flight team were getting ready to do another sh shuttle launch in a couple of months, and they're looking at some changes that are proposed. They walked outside when the one Challenger exploded coming off the launch pad. And everybody looked at each other else and said, you know, we really, really have to look at everything we're doing. I think a little bit more rigorously. He was instrumental. They stood up a senior executive review panel that any proposal had to go through. And with that panel to this day, they have never, ever had another major incident. So, but that was Roy's vision and just what a legacy that he's been able to leave with NASA and make a huge difference in what they're doing. He is such an advocate of having management in the field. You've heard the acronym, hopefully, MBWA, management by walking around. I, I've done a lot of talks on that. I have a paper on it. I'll be glad to share with you. As long as it's great to have management in the field, but you want to have a little process to help them so they can do it well. Be curious about the work being performed, kind of what you're seeing now. For some management, that's a little harder because now you got to appreciate you may not know everything you're seeing. So don't. it's okay to ask a few questions or ask them what they like best about what their job, what training they had to take to get it, and just what's some of the unique things that they're doing. Majority of people really enjoy ex explaining why they're special as far as the work they're doing and how much they enjoy what they're working with. And just like you heard before with Odie, right? the importance of being a good listener. Roy was exceptional with that because I would sit in some meetings and observe him and I knew he had the answer. He waited. He let other people share their thoughts, their discussion. They went, he let people debate a little bit professionally back and forth. And then he said, well, I think what I heard said was, well, have we thought about this as well? I went, very, very smooth. Take action to improve conditions. You heard me early on talking about employee engagement. The best way to shut employee engagement down is walk through a building or your shop, whatever you're doing, say, hey, you know, Mary, Fred, George, is there anything we can do different to improve? And they say, yeah, thank you for asking. And you'll fill in the dots. Then they never hear from you again. It's probably going to happen no more than twice, maybe three times. And when you walk through that building or shop floor again, you'll say, hey, is there anything we think we ought to do to improve on? They're probably going to say no, because they never heard anything back. So above and beyond just stay in communication, figure out your funding. Maybe it's a line item for the following fiscal year. Fix stuff. True story is a large site here in Nevada had a new team come in and they had one of the exterior doors would hit this little baby step down transformer. Just they can we put the transformer in the wrong spot? No safety issue, but you couldn't open the door all the way. So the people work there, they're talking to the new senior team, and the vice president says, well, let me look at that. I think we need to move it. Within 30 or 45 days, it was moved. That spread like wildfire. Hey, with these new guys and gals, if you say something to them, something happens. They fix it. And pretty soon they're getting dozens and dozens of ideas on how just to improve operations. So now, yeah, now everything is starting to realize, oh, maybe we can avoid some cost, right? And the role of the workforce in effective communications is critical. Anybody in that workforce, guys, gals, spinning the wrenches for a living, you have an obligation to get engaged. And sometimes I think candidly, this can be overlooked as well. They talk about what the leadership team needs to do. Well, this is where that workforce, the people that out there every day making all the difference, they have to have skin in the game as well. So from Mikey's perspective, get off the porch, stop you know, and stand there crossing your arms. Let's all get engaged together and you're gonna have a better organization for it. And odds are, I think you're going to even like what you're doing that much better. 
Don't go away. We're going to go be right back. We got to go to commercial. Stand by. Safety Culture Strategies provides world-class safety culture and safety program management consultative services for clients throughout the United States. Whether your company is pursuing voluntary protection program star designation, ISO 45001 certification, or considering a comprehensive review of your current safety programs and processes, Safety Culture Strategies brings hands-on experience combined with a unique perspective that readily translates from senior management to task level personnel. This collective skill set provides you with a very insightful health check of your overall safety management system that can also assist with reducing injuries and attrition as well as increasing profitability. Safety Culture Strategies is also certified to provide Ziegler Institute employee engagement training and leadership coaching. When combined with established relationships with federal and state regulators, Safety Culture Strategies is unique positioned to assist the safety culture efforts of any company. For additional information, visit www.scstrat.com or call us at 702-780-1410. After all, every company has a safety culture, but is it the culture you want? Is it the culture you want? Hey, we're back. <laughs> Talking to a lot of my guests, and we have new ones coming up or as we go into season two. They have some culture stuff I really want. Wow, if I have to pick like my top five, top ten of people I really enjoy hanging out with, Larry Wilson is very high on that list. He's founder and chief visionary officer of Safe Start. He's worked with over 2,500 companies, and his Safe Start process is used by over 2 million individuals in 50 countries. Yeah, he, he's got he's got this kind of spread around. And he, he has his own podcast. Now he'd like to have me on his, which I'm thrilled to be able to share some of my thoughts with his viewers. And again, Larry really, really understands all of this con consideration about human errors because that got my attention a long time ago. And I've always been a big fan of his approach. Because I tell organizations, individuals, by definition, are error prone. Now, you, you notice I didn't say accent prone. Next makes me a little twitchy. Error prone. In my case, I'm coming to the broadcast studio today, and guess what? I took a right instead of a left, and I wasn't coming towards the studio anymore. So we're error prone, and we can do X amount of errors a day. So any organization you want to have and design and have a error tolerant process, and part of that error of tolerance is how you respond when the error occurs. And I've had senior management go, really? I said, because if you come down hard on the people, you only focus on the negative, and you're gonna see some parallels in here in a second, it's got, you probably aren't gonna go where you want, choose to, or would like to have as your safety culture. Larry says you have to be able to get comfortable and feel the culture the way it is. I've done a lot of talks on culture and one of the scenarios I have is you you pull into two different used car lots and one place the cars are kind of dirty and the salesman's not dressed very professional he's got you know ketchup stains on his old beat up shirt and and the other lot everything's cleaned you're gr greeted professionally you, you can look, look in where they repair the vehicles all the tools are put away and you're going wow well congratulations you just made a judgment and a feel of their culture you haven't even spoken to anybody yet. And that happens a lot. So as you're out there, as you're listening, it can be as simple as there's posting hard hats worn all the time. Does everybody wear them all the time when you walk through? Uh, here's a question for senior management. When you go through a, a visit, do you wear your hard hat? Because you're helping set the tone. So you get a feel of your culture and you say, this isn't exactly what I was thinking. Well, there's ways to look at that too. The potential for human error is universal. It is worldwide. So you want to look at tools and techniques that can help moderate what happens when that error occurs. Move away from just focusing on negative results, especially in the world of safety. Scott Geller and a lot of the big time guys, Tom Krauss, Dr. Dr. Krauss talk about this, Dr. Geller, that majority of processes in a company, you also look at the positive side. Usually in safety, well, this is how many people got hurt this month. 
So how do you look at how has, how has safety improved our process? Ooh, right? So look at some different aspects to truly measure how safety is making a difference for your program. And when you focus on these human error efforts, you're going to find say, such broad wealth of information above and beyond the traditional root cause. Not discounting root cause, big fan, don't, don't send me cards and letters. But when you're recognizing that human error as well, a lot of times that's the, what we call the man-machine interface. Did that contribute to the issue? And the leadership, they got to recognize that human error reduction, just like your safety culture, it's an ongoing journey. It's not going to happen overnight. But keeping a steady hand on the throttle and keep that bow aimed where you want, you're going to get there and you're going to learn a lot along the way and your company is going to be better for it. Okay. <laughs> Last but definitely not least, because my goal is to keep us around 30 minutes. I knew it was going to be kind of tough. Dr. Chuck Pettiger came on and phenomenal guy with predictive analytics. He's got over 30 years experience <laughs> developing safety culture change initiatives. He was named one of the 101 leaders by industrial safety and hygiene news. And he's spoken at conferences around the globe. Yeah, he's a player. And I, and we chatted a lot. He goes, I'm so fortunate. I get to chat with these guys. <laughs> if not weekly, usually other, other, every other week, what's going on, what's changing, what do they see coming? And he said, the importance of having a, having a conversation. So when your boss or that leader comes on to that shop floor or stops by your office, hey, how are you doing today? You look forward to it. I'll be candid. I was working in, with an organization. They had about 3,000 people. And the president, you know, he's the president. So he's a busy guy. So I'm visiting with a couple of the team members in an office the week of Christmas. And he stopped by to say hi. And everybody kind of, they froze. They weren't sure what was going on because they had never seen him in their building before. Now, he was trying his best. Don't get me wrong. Just, hey, it's a good time to reach out and say hi to you. Howdy, but unfortunately, it happened on such a rare occasion, it became a little uncomfortable. And I, if he'd fear, I, maybe maybe I stop by every you know two or three months and and just say howdy to, and then this conversation. Talk about them as an individual. Of course, you want to talk about the work. It's good to, if hey, you have a better way to improve it, or is there a way to avoid some of the hazards associated with your work? Of course, that's important. Do me a favor. Ask them what they like to do on the weekend. If they have kids, ask them what's going on with their children. Odds are their face is going to light up and you're going to start establishing even more common ground. And they're going to look at you as a person and maybe even almost a peer, which is really cool in my own opinion, versus just the big boss. The key tenets, caring. We already talked about that a little bit. Trust. And uh, you've heard this before. Trust is hard to get and easy to lose. It can happen that quick. And that personal engagement, because personal engagement and that constant communication that proves providing value, that will help with the trust. The best way for the trust, follow through on what you're saying. And also they say, there's something I need to tell you. You can't tell anybody else. Right? Sometimes you have to explain to them, well, we may need to, we may have to get human resources involved or HR depending on the topic. Heard earlier about the perils of perception surveys and Dr. P Chuck Penninger is all over the, because they've worked with so many companies, they see low scores, they immediately go, it's a quote, go attack it. And he says, take a breath and validate those results. If people says, I don't like the fact I had to wear a pink shirt every day. Or were you ever told you had to wear a pink shirt every day? Or did you think you had heard that? So validate some of those lower scores and then get people engaged and figure out, okay, exactly what we want to be able to do to fix them. Routine inspections in and themselves. I'm going full circle. You knew I would. They can become a venomous cycle. I like that one. Everybody's heard the phrase, you check the box. You want me to do inspection? Okay, here you go. And you don't necessarily, you mentally throw it over your shoulder. It gets filed somewhere and it's not. And then to why, why didn't you find this when you did the inspection? Well, you told me to get the inspection done. I was kind of in a hurry, so we got it done for you. So, 
here, and so I always like getting data because I'm a little bit of a st statistician just for the, the more data I can have around me. Okay, that is not a typo. And it actually the number's higher than this now. Based on 500 million data points. That's M, as you know, a whole pile, as my granddaddy would say. Here's what Dr. Pettinger and his team have been learning. Increased inspections can contribute to reduced injuries. The more, frequency you're, the more frequent you're out there looking. The frequency of the inspection to build on that and the diversity of the inspection team can greatly enhance the results. I've worked with organizations that we would take electricians on a building inspection and, and they might look at some work their carpenters are doing or vice versa. You bring a fresh set of eyes, right? And somebody has a different perspective and they may have some insight you never thought about. So from the final thoughts today, just what have I, what have I been learning? Cause man, I'm, I'm just like a big sponge. I like to soak up all this great information. So what's some common themes? Communication. You want to be consistent. You want to be kind of, you want, definitely want to be engaged. You want to learn about as a person, figure out your management style. And is it the management style you really want? And appreciate where you're at. Lots of organizations can help you do that. That can be a very reflective moment for any manager of what I call the C-suite. Have trust. Do people really have confidence in what you're saying? It can take some effort to get there. It is worth it. Building those personal relationships. I, didn't, I can't state that enough when they look forward to you coming by. Say, hey, Rick's coming over, my boss. Where? That's really cool. And then, and then they'll say, hey, before you even ask this, guess what my kids did over the weekend? They got their black belt in karate. Yeah, and then you're getting there. Having a strategy for all these pieces where it's, we're going to figure out how to make 10% more widget this year. We want to reduce attrition by 15% because attrition is such a horrific expense for any organization. Have that cohesive strategy, get your team involved, flow it through your organization so they know how they can help. Understanding the why, whether it's results of a survey, a, a, an assessment from external organization, or you, now you're all of a sudden you're getting lots of people with suggestions that just really don't make sense. Why is that occurring? And this is an ongoing journey. Unfortunately, there's some sort of organizations out there that want to sell you the latest CD, the latest thumb drive, you know the drill, the latest book, or go raffle and, and, and win a new vehicle, and it's going to change your company overnight for your safety culture. I have yet to see that occur in all candidness. That's my tagline. It's just... Is it the culture you want? But it is an ongoing journey. But when it's done well, it's one of the best journeys you'll ever have in your career. Best journeys you'll ever have with your company. And you're going to have a team that other organizations look at and say, man, why can't we be like that? And our, I want to thank all our podcast guests throughout season one. They've been so generous with their time and their perspective. They've been patient with me. Also, encourage any viewers that would be interested and say, hey, hey, Mike, I've got some ideas I'd like to sh share for the show. A, you're welcome. I'd love to hear from you. And Rick, can you pull up our contact slide? I think we've got some information there to let everybody see how they can get a hold of me. You can get on my, the office number 702-780-1410. The website's www.scstrat.com. Or you can reach me at Mike, go figure, M-I-K-E at scstrat.com. Until next time, I want to thank you for viewing. That This is our first reflections for season one. We're not done with season one, so we'll have more reflections again later on. Thank you for your time once again, and enjoy your safety culture journey, and be safe out there.